If you have your Bibles, we need to go to a passage of scripture we visited before. Turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 12, and we're going to lift up verse 11. And when you find it, let me know by saying amen. And if you're still looking, let me know by saying wait on me. Amen, because I am a firm believer. We need to read the word of God for ourselves. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. Are we all there? Anybody still looking? Amen. Those of us that can, let us reverence God by standing at the reading of his word. Those of us that have impairments, please remain seated. But the Bible says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto death is that not what your bible says by the power of the holy spirit from the aid of your prayers for a few moments of your time i want to talk about deliverance by the blood take your seats and pray with me for just a little while eternal god and our father our Lord and our Savior. It is preaching time now. And as always, Master, we need the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Father, first and foremost, I pray that Terrence Grooms decrease, that Jesus Christ might increase, that your name be magnified, your people be edified, and in the end, some soul might be saved. Father, I ask for a fresh anointing that you cleanse me from the innermost parts of my being to the outermost parts of my soul, that I am a clean conduit of your word that it might flow through freely. I pray now, Master, that you bless your people, that your word will fall on fertile ground, that believers are made stronger and non-believers come into the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. Finally, Father, I pray that you rebuke the adversary that we might do the work you've called us to do on this side of Zion. Give the Progressive Baptist Church, give every church the prosperity that they need to succeed in this season, to lead more people to you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Deliverance by the blood. Brothers and sisters, as we come together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, this is a Sunday that ought to be a unique experience in our lives. This is not a Sunday that ought to be avoided like some people do. Oftentimes they don't understand the parameters and the dynamics that takes place when we come to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Oftentimes people will look at this as a Sunday to take off, as this is a Sunday to shy away, as this is the Sunday to back up and not partake of the commitment that we have to God. And I've stopped by to remind you that the reason why too many times this Sunday is avoided rather than appreciated is because people don't really understand 
understand what it's all about. Uh, we need to recognize that we ought to worship God and reverence God every single day. Uh, but it comes to a point when we worship him uh, and come to the place of the Lord's Supper, it ought to have a different reverence and resonation in our spirit. Uh, we ought to recognize that when we come to celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are saying something important and dynamic, not just to the entire body of Christ, uh, but to the entire world. Uh, but I stopped by to remind you that before we can appreciate the Lord's Supper, we got to come with the right approach. Uh, can I talk about the approach for just a moment? Uh, because when it's time to celebrate the Lord's Supper, the first thing you got to realize is that this is a solemn occasion. Truth be told, oftentimes people are too cavalier when it comes down to celebrating the Lord's Supper. That too oftentimes they don't take it seriously and they don't understand the impact that it has. And so they will come to church and the first thing that they'll think about is what they left on the stove at the household. They will come to church and the first thing they'll wonder is how soon will we get out? Now, when they come to church, they'll wonder about what ball game am I going to watch next? What is the preacher really going to talk about? What is the choir going to sing? What does Sister Sally have on? And they come the church with all of the wrong things on their mind but when it comes down to the Lord's Supper we need to recognize that this is a solemn occasion and so I ought to have a different and deeper focus about my worship this is a solemn occasion and I need to consecrate my mind directed toward the sacrifice that my Savior gave to me this is a solemn occasion and I'm not thinking about what's on the stove I'm not thinking about what I plan to do in a few minutes I'm just thinking about my fellowship with my God. I stop by to remind you that when we come to celebrate the Lord's Supper, this is a time of a solemn occasion. Not only is it a solemn occasion, but it is a sacred occasion. Can I say something now that I didn't say before? The Lord's Supper is not for everybody. Let me say that again. Yes, the Lord's Supper is not for everybody. You see, we got this misnomer until we say that everybody is God's child. But I got news for you. We are not all God's children. We are all God's creation. But we're not all his children. His children obey his voice. His children walk with him. His children have been obedient to the repentant call of honoring Jesus as Christ, Lord and Savior. And when we come to the table, the table is not for everybody. The table is for his children. The table is not for those who are walking away from him. The table is for those who want to walk with him. The table is not for those that are disobedient to him. But the table is for those who are bowing down before his presence. This is a solemn occasion and a sacred occasion. And the problem that we have in the modern church is the same problem that they had at Corinth. They lost the sacredness of the occasion. They thought it was about form or fashion. They thought it was just another time to get together. They thought it was a time that the higher up uh, can separate themselves from those that didn't have as much. Uh, but I stopped by to remind you, uh, I'm so glad that in Christ Jesus, uh, there's no big eyes or little you's. Uh, I'm so glad that in Christ Jesus, uh, there's no mighty me and tiny you's. Uh, the Bible reminds us uh, that we are all equal at the foot of the cross. Uh, no male or female. Uh, no Jew or Gentile, no black or white. We're just folk that's been redeemed. Can I get my shout on? I'm glad that at the cross, the only thing that matters is my heart. And so because of that, it is a sacred occasion. It not only is a solemn occasion, not only is it a sacred occasion, but it's an occasion to be celebrated. You see, that's one of the problems with the Lord's Supper. People don't understand that this is a special celebration. Uh, you see, oftentimes people will, will, will stop by and they'll go back to remembering the things that they've done in their past. Uh, and because of the things that they've done in their past, uh, they avoid the table. Uh, but I want you to understand uh, that when we come to celebrate the Lord's Supper, uh, we're not celebrating who we used to be. Uh, we are celebrating our deliverance. Uh, can I get a praise break again? Uh, does anybody remember what you used to be before you? met Jesus. Does anybody remember how the devil had your mind wrapped up and tangled? Does anybody remember how you was on the fast track 
to hell. Uh, but somewhere along the line, uh, the Holy Ghost met you at your Damascus Road. Uh, and God picked you up out of the miry clay. Uh, and then you felt freedom for the first time. Uh, free to walk with the Lord. Uh, free to say no to sin. Uh, free to walk in uh, the presence of the Almighty. Uh, and because of your freedom, uh, you found a reason to celebrate. Uh, I don't celebrate my perfection. Uh, I celebrate my deliverance. This occasion is an occasion to celebrate. And so when we come to the table, we ought to come with a different mindset. We ought not come with our head hung low. We ought to come with our hearts overjoyed. We ought to not come looking down on our neighbor. But we ought to come looking up to our God. We ought not come looking inward uh, at our own righteousness, uh, but we ought to look outward to the glory of the one that cleaned us. Uh, this is celebration time. Uh, and I got news for you. Uh, I got a reason to celebrate. And what we celebrate is our deliverance. Can I walk through the text very briefly before I let you go home? Because oftentimes when we begin to think about our deliverance, uh, we got to remember how we were delivered. Uh, because I got news for you. Uh, we did not deliver ourselves. Uh, can I talk about Terrence Grooms for a moment? Uh, because when I look at the track record of my life, uh, I recognize that I got myself in some mess that I could not get out of. Uh, and so I realize it was not my intelligence uh, that delivered me. Because uh, if I was smart enough, uh, I wouldn't have been in that mess to start with. Uh, you got to recognize uh, that I didn't get out because I was so smart. Because uh, if I was smart, I'd have never got in. It wasn't my intelligence that delivered me. Nor was it my money that delivered me. Truth be told, I don't care how much money you get, you'll never have enough. You can't buy everything, and there's some things that money can't buy. I stopped by to tell you, money might be able to buy a nice car, uh, but it can't pave your way to heaven. Uh, money might be able to buy a nice house, uh, but it can't get you into glory. Uh, money might be able to buy you a piece of pie, uh, but it can't buy you a piece of mind. Uh, so I stopped by to tell you, uh, there's some things that money can't do. Uh, and I discovered a long time ago uh, that money cannot deliver my soul. Uh, and so when I look at my deliverance, uh, I knew that my intellect couldn't do it. Uh, and my money couldn't do it, uh, nor could my righteousness do it. When I begin to think about even the best that I've done, there were some imperfections in it. And the reason why there were some imperfections in my best is because at my best, I'm still imperfect. And don't look at me crazy. When you look in the mirror, you're looking at imperfection too. Every last one of us got a flaw in our walk. Every last one of us got a hitch in our giddy up. Every last one of us got a hair out of place and a mole somewhere we don't want nobody to know. What am I trying to say? Every last one of us still got some things that God is working on. And so when you start to think it's all about your righteousness, you got to go back to what Isaiah said, that my righteousness is but filthy rags when it compares to the glory of God. So when I think about my deliverance, I know that I could not be good enough because I'm not perfect in my Myself. But we're celebrating our deliverance. How were we delivered? Church, I'm glad you asked. Jesus reminded us that we are delivered by the blood. Can I walk through the text for a few moments? Because in this passage of scripture, uh, and I'm not going to go through the whole dialogue because we've gone through this before, but we got to remember that this is a depiction of a spiritual warfare going on uh, over the souls of all mankind. And the Bible reminds us that in this warfare, there was an adversary going after the children of God. Can I park right there for a moment? Uh, you got to realize that the adversary is still going after the children of God. Can I preach it a little closer? He's not just going after the children of God. He's going after the children of this world. He's not just going after the children of this world. He's going after your children and your grandchildren. The adversary is still seeking those whom he made his power. Can I talk about his character? Yes, the Bible depicts the adversary, that old dragon that was cast out of heaven 
taking a third of the angels in glory with him. Uh, a third of those that saw creation uh, also saw the devil kicked out and followed the devil. Uh, you got to understand the character of the adversary. Uh, first of all, when you think about the character of the adversary, uh, his character is divisive. Uh, can I talk about that for a moment? Uh, because anytime you see somebody, they're always trying to break something up. Uh, anytime you see somebody, they're always trying to pit one against the other. Uh, anytime you try to get somebody, and it's always about whose side are you on, uh, that lets you know that they are divisive. Uh, and anybody that is divisive uh, is being used by the devil. Uh, I didn't say they were the devil, uh, but the devil will use divisiveness uh, to tear down the unity that God employs. Uh, but I'm so glad uh, that anybody the devil touches, uh, God can still deliver. Yeah. Not only is he divisive, but he's also selfish. You see, you got to understand the nature of the adversary uh, because when he looked at the glory of God and he saw the worship that God got, uh, he decided that I want what God is getting for myself. Uh, and I need to warn us to be careful of some selfish people in your life uh, because if they're all about themselves and never about the whole, uh, then the problem is not them but the devil that's in them. Uh, the devil will always seek me, myself, and mine. Uh, the devil will always think about uh, how it affects me and nobody else. Uh, the devil will always look at uh, what benefits me first. Uh, and I stop by to remind you, uh, we got to be careful uh, of people who are used by the devil in their life because uh, sometimes uh, the devil will have somebody that looks like an angel of light uh, planted in your camp, uh, but their selfishness uh, will take you away from the power of God. Uh, the devil wants to let you know, uh, I've come to kill, steal, and destroy. Uh, let me destroy your relationship uh, by being selfish in your life. Oftentimes, we're looking for the devil with a pitchfork and horns when we need to start looking at character and attitude. Are they divisive? Are they selfish? Do they breed dissension? You see, not only does the devil divide, but he'll start to put one against the other. He'll start to whisper little things in everybody's ear to make this one mad at that one and that one mad at the other one. And everybody's mad and nobody know what they're mad about. Uh, baby, that's just the devil working his magic. Uh, so I stop by to remind you, uh, we need to recognize the character of the devil in our world. Secondly, not only do we need to recognize his character, we need to recognize his work. There's a twofold work that the devil has, and I'm going to talk about it before I close this message out. The first thing you got to understand is that the Bible says that the devil came to deceive the world. The devil has this world wrapped around his finger because they have been tricked and beguiled with deception. Let me talk about a few deceptions before I press on. The first thing you got to understand is that the devil has this world beguiled because he's got the world thinking and deceived in the fact that he's not real. Let me say this again. In this new age world that we live in where everybody feels like there is just a major spirit and that there's nothing else, you got to understand that if the Bible says that it's real, then it's real. If there is a heaven, then there is also a hell. If there is a Michael, there is also a Lucifer. And if there is a savior, then there is also a persecutor. And you got to realize the devil got folk thinking that he's not real. And he causes us to because think that we're not real, to cause every man to seek his own way, to follow his own footsteps to do what he want to do uh, and think that I don't have to answer to anybody. Uh, the devil has allowed us uh, to think that he's not real uh, and cause us to face the ire and wrath of God. Uh, but I stop by to remind you, uh, if you inhale and exhale without Jesus, uh, you're going to find out just how real the devil is. He deceives the world by making people think that he's not real. He deceives the world by making people think that God is holding back something from you. Can I go to the garden for a moment? You see, in the garden, the devil deceived Eve into making her think that God was holding something back from her. He said, God didn't really mean that you would die. He just wanted you to understand you'll be like him. God don't want you to have certain things. And that's what the devil has done to this world. He has deceived the world into thinking that the God don't want them to have some fun. Can I preach the way I feel? I stop by to remind you, don't nobody have more fun than I do. I've learned to laugh at some stuff, enjoy some stuff, and have a good time because my 
joy is not dependent on what's around me. My joy is dependent on who's inside of me. My happiness does not depend on what's happening in my life. My happiness depends on who holds my life. And so I want you to understand, I have a good time. There's an old song we used to sing, Enjoying Jesus. Hallelujah. I got news for you. You want to see what fun looks like. Entertain a right relationship with God. He's got folk deceived into thinking that we are to live a miserable life. When Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He's deceiving us. Or I should say he's deceiving the world. Not only does he want the world to think he's not real. Not only does he want the world to think he won't have a good time. But he wants the world to think that there is another way to God. Just listen to what folk are talking about. Just listen to some of these doctrines that are going on. Just listen to some of the conversations of mankind. And we're living in a society where everybody thinks that you can get to heaven the Burger King way. Uh, You don't have to go this way or that way. You can choose your own way. Uh, But can I talk about scripture for just a moment? Uh, Because the last time I checked, uh, Jesus said, I am the way, uh, the truth, and the life. Uh, No man comes to the Father but by me. Uh, I want you to remind yourself today, uh, the only way I can get to God uh, is that I got to go through Jesus. Uh, I can't go through my Muhammad. I can't go through Buddha. I can't go through Confucius. Can I get real in the house? I can't go through Terrence Grooms. I can't go through Robert Baco. I can't go through James Outland. If I'm going to get to God, I got to go through Jesus. There is no other way. I don't care what folks say. I don't care what philosophy says. Jesus said there's only one way. I don't care about religion. I care about your walk. Walk with Jesus. He is deceitful and still deceiving. But he didn't stop there. Because it says not only does he deceive the world, but he accuses the brethren. You got to understand who he's talking about. Now he's not talking about the world. He's talking about us who's already been converted. He's talking about us who've already been to the foot of the cross. He's talking about us, as the old folk used to say, who've already been to the water and been baptized. He's talking about us uh, who say we call on the name of the Lord. Uh, The Bible said uh, he has a job, uh, and his job is to accuse the brethren. Can I talk about that accusation for just a moment? Because when we look at the word accuse, uh, if we look at it in the very literal sense, uh, it's using a very judicial term uh, to accuse you of a crime, uh, to present those things that you were done uh, so that you might receive judgment. Uh, and can I park something in your Holy Ghost bucket? Uh, the devil will never accuse you with a lie. When the devil goes to the throne room of God and brings up your name and starts to recite the things that you have done, The devil don't have to lie on you because you've done enough in your past uh, for it to be true already. Can I preach the way I feel? Uh, Because you got to understand uh, it's only holiness that gets us to God. uh, And the devil wants to accuse you uh, of all of the unholiness in your lifestyle. Uh, That's why it's important uh, for us to walk upright. Uh, That's why it's important uh, for us to lay down every sin that so easily beset us. Uh, That's why it's important uh, to be holy because God is holy. Uh, The Bible said uh, the devil wants to accuse you. Uh, Can I walk it out? like this uh, if he accuse you of lying uh, it's because you did it Uh, if he accuse you of backbiting uh, it's because you did it Uh, if he accuse you of idolatry uh, it's because you did it Uh, if he accuse you of being a whoremonger uh, it's because you did it Uh, if he accuse you of being divisive uh, it's because you did it because the devil knows he can't take a lie to God but he can take the truth to God about your life the adversary wants to destroy mankind's relationship with God 
And in this theory, in this, in this paradigm, in this structure, in this picture that John saw, he saw the people of God being chased by the devil. Uh, and in the end, they gave a testimony. They began to say, how did we make it out? Uh, there's an old song that says, how I got over. My soul looks back in wonder uh, how I got over. Well, let me park right there for a moment uh, and tell you how we got over. Uh, because they said uh, the reason why we got over uh, is because of the blood of the lamb uh, and the word of our testimony. Can I preach that in reverse for a moment? Because when he talks about the word of our testimony, he's not just talking about how God woke me up this morning and started me on my way. When he talks about the word of my testimony, he's not talking about how God just blessed me with a new house uh, and blessed me with a new car. When he talks about the word of my testimony, uh, he's not talking about how God gave me a new suit. Because guess what? Uh, the devil folk wearing some suits too. Uh, the devil folks living in some houses too. Uh, the devil folk getting some jobs too. Uh, but when he talks about the word of his testimony, uh, it literally means uh, I got to agree with what God has done. Uh, and my record states uh, that Jesus went to the cross uh, for my sins. Uh, and so how I got over, I got over because I believed in his work. I got over because I submitted myself to his authority. I got over because of what he's done. Well, what did he do? He shed his blood. So I stopped by to remind us this Sunday morning that when we come to the deliverance, or I should say when we come to the table, what we're doing is we're celebrating our deliverance by the blood. When we come to the table, uh, we'll celebrate the fact that God washed away all of our sins. Uh, when we come to the table, uh, we're celebrating the fact uh, that I'm not what I used to be uh, and I'm not going where I used to go because uh, I've been delivered by the blood. Uh, and can I help somebody shout right now? Uh, God is always delivered by the blood. Uh, if you don't believe me, uh, come here, Brother Adam. Uh, Adam said when I was in the garden uh, and I sinned against God uh, and did what I wanted to do, uh, I covered myself with fig leaves. Uh, but my fig leaf couldn't do it. But I'm so glad that God looked down from glory and saw my need created in animal skin. He covered me in the blood that I might be redeemed. Come in, brother Abraham. Tell me your story. Abraham said, I love God with all my heart. And God said, give up your only son. I laid my son on the altar. And as I drew back my arm, he said, hold on. There's a ram in the bush. I let loose my son. Picked up the ram. Slayed the ram. I was delivered by the blood. You don't believe it, Adam? You don't believe Abraham? Maybe you'll believe Israel. Israel was the people of God. Trapped in Egypt. Israel was the people of God. Oppressed by sinful nation and God said what I'll do to let Pharaoh know I'm in charge is I'll send a death angel to wipe out every firstborn but now if you want to be delivered you got to take the blood uh, and cover the doorpost uh, so that when the death angel uh, rolls by, uh, as long as he sees the blood, uh, he's going to pass on by. Uh, I stopped by to tell you, uh, Israel said, uh, I've been delivered uh, not by might, uh, not by chariot, uh, not by weaponry. Uh, I've been delivered uh, by the blood. Uh, I stopped by to tell you, uh, I got one more testimony. Uh, come here, Terrence Grooms. Uh, Terrence Grooms will tell you, uh, when I look at my life, Life, uh, and realize what I've done. Uh, knew I needed a savior. Uh, I looked to the cross uh, and there I found Jesus. Uh, I looked to the cross uh, who shed his blood for me uh, and all of my sins uh, have been washed away. Uh, I've been delivered uh, by the blood. Uh, look in the mirror, uh, you blood bought believers, uh, and tell God thank you. You've been delivered uh, by your blood. Uh, not the blood of goats, uh, but the blood of Jesus.